Kia ora koutou and welcome back to Biophysical Principles. All right, so in this lesson, we are going to take a bit of a look at exponentials and logarithms. It's not going to be an in-depth sort of coverage of this topic, and for some of you it will probably just be revision. But for what we're going to talk about about sound in the following lesson, we need to be able to do some of the basic mathematical manipulations with exponentials and logs um, that you may not have done for a wee while. So what we're going to do in this one is sort of review the basics and some of the rules for how we manipulate them, and practice using exponentials and logs in a few sort of equation situations to see how we can deal with equations that contain these. And we've sort of viewed some basic ideas with exponentials in this course already. When we express the size of things, we often write it, we've, we've often tended to write quantities down as some number times a power of 10. So we're just going to go into some of the maths involved first with working with powers and see how this works out. So we're just going to focus in this lesson on powers of 10. There are some others that are quite important, but we're just going to focus on 10s for now. Okay, so we'll start with the easiest case which is positive integer powers of 10. So remember that for positive, positive integers k, the expression 10 to the k just means 10 times 10 times etc times 10 times 10, where essentially there are k 10s overall. So for example, 10 squared, well that's just 10 times 10, which is 100, and 10 to the 6, well that just literally means 10 times 10 times 10 times 10 times 10 times 10, times 10 which overall gives us 1 million. And, okay, so that's positive powers. We can do negative powers without sort of breaking much more sweat either. Um, we essentially define 10 to the negative k just to be 1 over 10 to the k. So, for example, 10 to the negative 2 would be 1 divided by 10 squared, which would be 1 over 100, etc. So we can build a nice little table of these powers. Uh, we'll start with k equals negative 4 and go up as high as k equals 4. And if we then fill in 10 to the k on the right hand side there, we'll get 0 0.0001 for 10 to the negative 4. We'll get 0 0.001 for 10 to the negative 3. We'll get 0 0.01 for 10 to the negative 2. We'll get 0 0.1 for 10 to the negative 1, etc. I'm going to put 1 in for 10 to the 0. I'll come back to that in a moment. And then I'll put 10 in for 10 to the 1, 100 in for 10 squared, 1000 in for 10 cubed, and 10,000 in for 10 to the power of 4. You can see by looking at that pattern that the only thing that really makes any sense for 10 to the 0 is that it equals 1. Because then we can just go up and down our table by either dividing by 10 if we're going upwards towards the negative numbers, or multiplying by 10 to go down towards these positives. Okay, so we can use this mental picture of just basically multiplying by lots of 10s, or lots of 1 over 10s if they're negatives, to come up with the following rule that's always going to work, um, at least for these integers. 10 to the a times 10 to the b is always going to be equal to 10 to the a plus b. So we can verify a couple of these from our table. So for example, 10 to the 3 times 10 to the 2, well we know that's 1000 times 100, which will give me 100,000, which is 10 to the 5. And 5 just so happens to be 2 plus 3, so we could have jumped straight to there in one step. Similarly, if we want to do 10 to the negative 2 times 10 squared, the long way around would be to say, okay, that's 0 0.01 times 100, which would therefore give us 1, which is 10 to the 0. Or we could just say, okay, negative 2 plus 2 is just 0, so we should get 10 to the 0 straight out. So this rule will always work for us. Okay, so we've got this sort of sense that we can do these powers of 10 for any integer powers. Our next trick is to say, all right, now we've gotten ourselves into that frame of mind, let's draw them on a graph and see if we can come up with an idea of what might happen in between those integers. Does it make sense to talk about, say, 10 to the power of 1.5? So you can see it's actually quite hard to draw this graph because the values get large really, really quickly. So maybe we'll just vaguely go up to 10 squared. So 10 to the negative 3, that's you can't, almost can't see it on the graph, it's basically 0 on the scale, so is 10 to the negative 2, 10 to the negative 1 is barely just above the axis, then 10 to the 0 that's 1, 10 to the 1 is 10, and then 10 squared would be 100 which is off the top of the graph. So to take powers of 10 between these values, it's just kind of like playing join the dots with a nice smooth curve. So if we were to sketch in this curve here, um, we will get a nice mathematical curve, which would give us things like what 10 to the 1.5 would be. Obviously, um, this will be programmed into something like your calculator, 
But just from looking at our picture, we can see that 10 to the 1.5 should be somewhere between 10 to the 1 and 10 squared. Um, so if you, do this, if you do this on your calculator, you ought to get, let's just try it, uh, 10 to the power of 1.5 gives me 31.6 approximately to one decimal place. Okay, and the other nice thing about multiplication is it still works just as well um, when we use non-integer powers. So that rule we came up with before of 10 to the a times 10 to the b equals 10 to the a plus b, this also works when these numbers are not integers themselves. All right, so let's just cover a wee bit of terminology here. So if I've got an expression like y is equal to 10 to the power of a, the number a is called the exponent, and the number 10... Well, that's called the base. We sometimes use other bases. Um, for example, a very common one is the base, which is a special number called E that we're not going to go into today, which is about 2.71828. Um, and then another common base is 2, especially if you're working on computers and you want to work in binary uh, where everything is represented by ones and zeros. Okay, but again, it's sort of outside of the scope of what we want to look at. So what we would like to do is um, focus on just using the base of 10 for the for the time being. But it's worth being, a, being aware that probably the most commonly used one in science is actually this base of E. So if you go on to do further science, then you'll probably come across this and eventually you'll probably use these even more often than powers of 10. Okay, so um, moving on. Now, we've sort of figured out how to calculate 10 to the power of something. But what if we actually want to find, do the opposite problem, which is to find the exponent given some value. Um, so if we're given a number like 100 and have to find a such that 10 to the a is equal to 100, what we do is we use a logarithm. So if 10 to the power of a is equal to y, we'll just put a placeholder in for the 100 now so it works in general, then this number a is called log of y or the logarithm to base 10 of y. Okay, so if we just go back to our 100 now. If 10 to the power of a is 100, then a would be log of 100, which indeed gives us 2. So your calculator probably has a log button. Um, try calculating the log of 100 on it and check that you get 2. So I'll do it on my Casio. I'll type in log 100, and indeed I get 2. Notice that there's a similar button, usually called ln, um, which is short for natural logarithm. It does the same thing, except in this case, the base is E instead of 10. Again, one of those things just to be aware of, um, but don't worry about that too much for now. Um, a little note on notation. Sometimes, um, just to be clear that we're working in base 10, we'd write log with little 10 of Y to emphasize that it's base 10. And that way, because the log to base E would be log to little E of Y, which is often just written as LN of Y. So it's commonly used. Sometimes just writing log can be a little bit ambiguous because some people might interpret that to mean to the base E. So if you want to be doubly sure to be clear, um, you can put that little 10 on the log to make sure that everyone knows you're taking logarithms to base 10. Okay, so um, now we've got our logarithms, we need some rules for manipulating these things. Now there are basically two, which is, or three, depending how, on how you think of it, rules that we primarily use when we're manipulating expressions involving logarithms. Now I'm gonna, not going to try and prove these things or anything like that. I'm just going to state them as rules that we can use and we'll see how they work in just a minute. So first off, um, log of a to the r is equal to r times log a. So the way I think of this is if you take log of an expression involving an exponent, the exponent just can hop out the front of the log and that cannot be a very useful property if you're trying to find out what that is. Our second property is that the log of a product, log of a times b, is equal to log of a plus log of b. Now, this is quite an interesting one, and historically it's been how complex multiplication problems were done before we had calculators and computers, because notice that when I take log of a product, it's turned it into a sum. So in the good old days, people used to have books full of tables of logarithms, and when they wanted to multiply two numbers together, they look up their logarithms, add those together, because adding is much easier than multiplying, and then that gives you the log of the product, which you then can then look up and go backwards. Okay, and finally, log of a quotient or a fraction, log of a over b, that's log a minus log b. 
couple of extra notes. Um, we can only ever take logarithms of positive numbers. That makes sense because 10 to the power of something is always going to be something positive. So to go backwards from that, it makes sense that we have to put a positive number in. And secondly, log to the base 10 and of x and 10 to the power of x are inverses of each other. What this means is that they kind of undo each other. So if you've got one of them in an equation and you want to get rid of it, you just do the opposite one. So for example, if I take log to the base 10 of 10 to the power of x, I'll just get x. And if I take 10 to the power of log 10 of x, I'll just likewise get x. They undo each other. All right, so we're going to finish off with a few problems just to see some of these rules kind of work in practice. So the first one, we're going to try and solve 10 to the r is equal to 400. So maybe you should pause the video before, uh, for each one of these, pause the video before I actually work through the answer, just to see if you can figure it out yourself. You might for this one even try and guess what you think the value of r should be approximately um, before you actually calculate it to see if you're on the right track. Okay, well 10 to the r equals 400. What I want to do is I want to take logs of both side of the, sides of this because I want to cancel out that 10 to the power of r. So that will give me log of 10 to the r is equal to log of 400. Log of 10 to the r, that just turns into r. And so r is log of 400, which I'll grab my calculator, will be log of 400 is about 2.60 to two decimal places. That makes sense because if r was 2, that'd be 10 squared, which is 100. And if r was 3, it'd be 1,000. So we were expecting something somewhere between 2 and 3 for our value of r. So that made sense. Okay, next one. Um, solve a log of x equals 3 for x. Okay, well, again, I can go ahead and see what I need to do here. This time I've got a log that I want to get rid of. So to undo that, I'm going to take 10 to the power of both sides of this. So 10 to the power of log x will equal 10 to the power of 3. The 10 to the power of log will cancel out to leave me with just x. And 10 to the power of 3 is 1,000. So this will give me that x equals 1,000. OK, next question. Here we've got 3 to the power of r equals 12. Notice we don't have a 10 this time. Um, it's 3, and a like a different base, if you like. But the cool thing is we can still use log to the base 10 to solve this. I'm just going to take log to the base 10 of both sides. So log of 3 to the r equals log of 12. Using my first log law, that r comes out the front. So I'll get r times log 3 equals log 12, which gives me r is log 12 divided by log 3, which will be log 12 divided by log 3 on the calculator is 2.26 to two decimal places. Okay, again, that makes sense because if it were two, that would be nine, and so I'm expecting something a little bit higher than that. Okay, question four. Can we express log three plus log four minus log five as a single logarithm? We sure can. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna group the log four and the log five first. Notice I'm gonna use my second two log laws to attack this one. When I've got a difference, that just turns into a quotient. So that will be equal to log 3 plus log of 4 over 5. Notice the minus log 5 turned into a 5 on the bottom of the fraction inside the log. And now I have the sum of two logs. So using my second log property, that will be log of 3 times 4 divided by 5, which will be log of 12 over 5. Okay, and lastly, uh, a very common application for logarithms and exponentials is dealing with population growth. So a population, we're told that a population grows according to the equation p equals 300 times 10 to the power of 0 0.01 times t, where here t is the amount of time measured in years. So maybe this gives us the, a population of some place in hundreds of thousands. You can, it doesn't really matter. Um, so first question is, what is the initial population, which is the population when t is 0? Well, all I have to do is substitute in 0 into my equation. So p of 0, that would be 300 times 10 to the 0 0.1 times 0. Now that's just 10 to the 0, which as we decided earlier was just 1. So that will overall be 300. And secondly, how long will it take the population to triple in size? Well, 
what we do here is we know it starts at 300. So when it's tripled in size, that means the population will now be 900. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say 900 equals 300 times 10 to the 0 0.1 times t. And what I'm trying to do is essentially solve this equation for t. Okay, so I'm going to start by dividing out that 300 and getting rid of it um, to get us one step closer. So if I divide both sides by 300, I will get 3 equals 10 to the power of 0 0.1, uh, sorry, 0 0.01 times t. Now I've got a 10 to the power of something that I want to adios, so I'm going to take log of both sides to get rid of that. So I'll now have log of 3 will be equal to log of 10 to the power of 0 0.01 times t. And as previously mentioned, the log and the 10 to the power of cancel themselves out. So that will give me log 3 equals 0 0.01 times t. And now I can get t by itself by multiplying through by 100. So I'll get t is 100 log 3, which if I again go through and do my calculation, 100 times log, using the right log button, of 3 is 47.7 years to one decimal place. So if this was the formula for my population growth, um, it'll tell me that it takes 47.7 years for this population to triple in size. Obviously, when it comes to mo modeling population growth, there are a few more things to take into account. And this kind of exponential growth never occurs forever. Um, some people used to think it was going to and prophesied a big collapse of human society a lot <laughs> about 100 years ago. But actually, there are other things that come into effect when the populations get a bit larger. Anyway, that's a bit off topic. So what we've got now is some tools for dealing with equations where we have exponentials and we have logarithms in them. Hopefully that wasn't too bad and you can now feel like you can attack a few problems involving logs and exponentials. We'll have problems like this to work on in the workshop coming up. Um, so I think we'll call that a day. So we'll leave it there and we'll see you next time. Kakite ano.